Okay, last week we started on a series on the, on the temptation of Christ. We're going to continue with that today. Um, don't know if I'll get it finished today or not. It might run into another week. We'll just see how, uh, we'll just see how far this goes. Um, last week, since, I mean, since my hands are, have been messed up, I had a, a sheet where I had the verses. It appears that I've forgot to bring that. So. I'm going to be flipping, which might, with one bad hand, take a little longer than it usually does. So that might stretch us a little bit more um, than it normally would. But we're, what we're dealing with here is is found in Luke chapter four. If you want to turn that, we'll we'll read the passage again, and then we can pick back up with where we left off. Luke chapter four and verse one. And Jesus, being full of the Holy Ghost, returned from Jordan and was led by the Spirit into the wilderness being forty days tempted of the devil. And in those days he did eat nothing, and when they were ended he afterward hungered. And the devil said unto him, If thou be the Son of God, command this stone that it may be made bread. And Jesus answered him, saying, It is written that man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word of God. And the devil taketh taking him up into a high mountain, showed unto him all the kingdoms of the world in a moment of time. And the devil said unto him, All this power will I give thee, and the glory of them, for that is delivered unto me, and to whomsoever I will I give it. If thou therefore wilt worship me, all shall be thine. And Jesus answered, and said to, him, said to him, Get thee behind me, Satan, for it is written, Thou shalt wor worship the Lord thy God, and him only shalt thou serve. And he brought him to Jerusalem, and set him upon a pinnacle of the temple, and said unto him, If thou be the Son of God, cast thyself down from hence. For it is written, He shall give, thee, give his angels charge over thee, to keep thee, and in their hands they shall bear thee up, lest at any time thou thou dash thy foot against a stone. And Jesus answering said unto him, It is said, Thou shalt not tempt the Lord thy God. And when the devil had ended all the temptations, he departed from him for a season. Last week we looked at um, verses 1 and 2. That's as far as we got. Um, and we noticed a couple of things from this, and that is, and, and as, we, as we continue on this morning, we want to pay close attention to the fact that we're looking at the manner in which Satan tempted Christ, which is the manner in which many times he tempts us. We can learn from what he did relative to Christ and apply it to how he goes about tempting us. If we know his game plan, so to speak, then we can start to spot it when it starts to happen to us. Much like for many years, it was, it was a mysterious thing for Wendy and I that when Communion Sunday rolled around, for some reason, I don't know, the kids always acted up more than they usually did, or the cars broke down more often than they usually did, or something got on our nerves more than it usually did. And it took us a while to figure out, oh, it's Communion Sunday, so that we could then expect things to happen. And then in talking to other people, we found out, well, they went through much the same kind of a, st kind of a thing. Same thing here. If we can figure out what what the devil's traits are, 
then we can start to spot him and we can tell oh that's you again now I know what to do with you I didn't know it was you before now I do you know one of the things when you're a new Christian sometimes you're not quite sure which spirit you're dealing with for a while you have to figure that out and sometimes you're listening to the wrong one so it's important to know which one's talking to you so you know which one it is all right that's part of the reason for this sermon so that you understand fully well who it is that's trying to tempt you because God doesn't tempt you with evil we looked at that those verses last week the fact is that what God does when he tempts you is just simply to test you to prove you to allow Satan to do something to prove your faith where Satan tries to tempt you into sinning so you that gives you a gives you a heads up as to who's as to who it is that's talking to you in the wee hours of the mo of the morning um, so by studying the political term is opposition research by by looking at what Satan does and what he did with Christ we can then apply some of that to what he does with us because it's it's much the same way and if we're familiar with his devices that that helps us now we looked also in verses 1 2 we looked at the circumstances of the of the tempt of this temptation um, we noticed that Christ had just been baptized it was at a very high point a very high spiritual point and that's a point when you can generally expect Satan to start tempting if the church all of a sudden experiences a lot of growth that's a time to start watching start paying attention if something's going on that's a time that that looks spiritually good that's a time to start getting your ears up and putting the antennas up because that seems to be a time that Satan will strike shortly after someone is baptized is usually one of the worst times of periods of temptation that they'll go through that's one of the times that Satan will really jump on your head right after you come out of the water and he won't leave you alone for a while um, and that's one of the things that we try to warn people when they're when they're first baptized expect some things to happen because they generally do and it's the same within the church and it's the same within your spiritual walk you you have a you have a conversation with someone that looks like it might actually lead to a conversion watch out because that's something that Satan doesn't want he's going to do everything he can to knock you off knock you off your blocks on that one and as we will see this morning he will use whoever he can use whether it be someone in the world or whether it be someone in the church he'll use your own best friends against you he will use whoever he can get a hold of to use and unfortunately a lot of people don't realize that they're being used but if you look at the patterns you can you can figure that out for yourself um, okay so so understand that during times of great spiritual blessings these are times to expect um, temptations of, of Satan and we looked at we looked at what happened with the nation of Israel right after Jericho right after they had taken Jericho one of the highest times and they were and one of them was tempted into doing something he shouldn't have done into violating one of God's laws and it affected the entire nation as a result um, we looked at Hezekiah we looked at Elijah that he fell to his lowest point right after right after the Mount Carmel incident um, and that brings us pretty much up to where we are today verses 3 through 4 is what we will begin with now um, verses 3 and 4 and Jesus or, uh, and the devil said unto him if thou be the Son of God command these this stone that it be made bread and Jesus answered him saying it is written that man shall not live by bread alone but by every word of God now there's something I'm going to point out in a minute I'm going to just mention it real quick and then move on but I'll and I'll deal with it a little bit more in a minute if thou be the Son of God if thou be the Son. how many times has it come into your head am I a child of God am I really a child of God well a pretty good indication of where that comes from isn't it that's what Satan uses constantly if thou be the child that's that's what he'll use against you 
He will use that over and over and over and over again against you to try to convince you that you're not a child of God so that you'll give up because why try anyway? I can't possibly be one. If he did it to Christ, he'll do it to you. And we will see that he sends his agents out to do exactly that. Now, his first, this first temptation of turning breads into stone, I want you to turn first to Matthew chapter 7. Matthew chapter 7, we're going to look at verses 9 through 10. Where Christ says, Or what man is there of you whom his son asked bread will give him a stone? Or if he ask a fish, will he give him a serpent? You see, Christ understood something that we're going to talk about in just a second. Verse 11, If ye then, being evil, know how to give good gifts unto your children, how much more shall your Father, which is in heaven, give good things to them that ask him? Christ was in a state of hunger here. He hadn't eaten in 40 days. We were just talking about the fact that when you go in for a surgical procedure, you can't eat after midnight. And, and if they schedule you for the 4 o'clock in the afternoon surgery, how hungry you are. He went for 40 days. That's a little, you're a little bit hungrier after 40 days than you are after a few hours. If we have a hard time dealing with just a couple hours, imagine what it's like to go for 40 days without any food. Christ was hungry. But he understood that God could feed him. All he had to do was ask, and God would feed him. And that was the point. Look at Luke chapter 11, verses 11 through 13. If a son ask bread of any of you that is a father, will he give him a stone? Or if he ask a fish, will he for a fish give him a serpent? Or if he ask an egg, will he offer him a scorpion? If ye then, being evil, know how to give good gifts unto your children, how much more shall your heavenly Father give the Holy Spirit to them that ask him? And the point that he's making here is that of all the gifts that you could possibly ask for, the Holy Spirit is the one that you want. More than temporal stuff. That's the one that you should be seeking for, rather than God can give you food anytime he wants to. Not a problem at all, and Christ knew this, but at the time, Satan was trying to tempt him because clearly he was hungry. Now this should teach you something. At the time of this temptation, there was a need for food. Satan attacks you in your areas where you're most vulnerable. That's where he will come after you at. He knows you very well. He knows how to get under your skin better than anyone else. He knows what will work. He knows that if I attack you from this angle, I've got a chance here. But if I come at you over here, well, I know you're strong there. I'm not going to mess with that. That'd be a waste of time. But if I come at you this way, this is, the, this is one of the reasons that we lose so many people because of, these, because of the holidays that, like the one we just had. Because he knows that he can get to people there. He knows that he can use some sort of a device to try to trick them into thinking that that's a good time for the family. And if he can get them young enough, when they haven't been in the church long enough, he can pull that family apart. And rather than lose the whole family, then the family fall apart, the family will usually leave. That's how it works. He's been doing it for thousands of years. He's not going to quit now. That's one of his tricks. It's been one of his tricks. And that's why we have to hang in there together and understand that that's where he's coming from. When those thoughts start to arise, understand where those thoughts are coming from. They're not coming from God. God is not asking you to do something that he doesn't want you to do. If those thoughts are coming to you, they're coming from Satan. So do what Christ did and get rid of them. But that's where he will attack. And he will use your friends to do it with. Turn to Luke chapter 22. Luke chapter 22. 
where we read in verse 1, Now the feast of unleavened bread drew nigh, which is called the Passover. And the chief priests and scribes sought how they might kill him, for they feared the people. Then entered Satan into Judas, surnamed Iscariot, being of the number of the twelve. Notice that. He entered into him. You see, if you grant access to this guy, he'll just slip right in on you. And he went his way and communed with the chief priests and captains how they might betray him unto them. And they were glad and covenanted to give him money, and he promised and sought opportunity to betray him unto them in the absence of the multitude. This is one of Christ's very own disciples, one of the twelve. And in Psalm chapter 41 and verse 9, in a prophecy relative to this, it says, Yea, mine own familiar friend in whom I trusted, which did eat of my bread, hath lifted up his heel against me. He'll take your very best friend and turn him against you. And slip in with you not even noticing that it's happening. The guy is, he is smart. And he knows what areas that he can get at you with, and he will use them against you over and over and over until he wins. That's why it's important that we stop him in his tracks the minute that it starts to come up. I want you to turn to Luke chapter 22. And let's see another one. Now this, we're going to talk about the Apostle Peter. Luke chapter 22. Now this is actually just slightly before Christ was crucified. And in verse 31 it says, The Lord said, Simon, Simon, behold, Satan hath desired to have you, that he may sift you as wheat. But I have prayed for thee, that thy faith fail not, and when thou art converted, strengthen thy brethren. This is the Apostle Peter. Satan was after him. And Christ knew it and told him as much. He want, Now, you don't get much more of a child of God than the Apostle Peter, do you? Was the Apostle Peter not clearly by this time a child of God? This is just before the, just before the crucifixion. Now, shortly after this, he denied Christ three times out of fear, but look what he went on to do after that. You see, Satan almost got him. He almost got him. This is clearly a child of God that he's going after. And he was warned by Christ. Now, with that in mind, I want you to flip back to Mark chapter 8. So before you start thinking, well, maybe he can get some people, but he's not going to get me. We're talking about the Apostle Peter. And he almost got him. Mark chapter 8, verse 33. But when he had turned about and looked on his disciples, he, he re oh wait, I, I need to move back a little bit to get the context here. Look at verse 27. Jesus went out and his disciples into the towns of Caesarea Philippi, and by the way he asked his disciples, saying unto them, Whom do men say that I am? And they answered, John the Baptist, but some say Elias, and others one of the prophets. And he saith unto them, But whom say ye that I am? And Peter answered and said unto him, Thou art the Christ. Now this was long before the conversation that they just had. Long before that, Peter already knew that he was the Christ. God had already showed him that. And he charged them that they should tell no man of him. And he began to teach them that the Son of Man should, must suffer many things and be rejected of the elders and of the chief priests and the scribes and be killed and after three days rise again. And he spake that saying openly, and Peter took him and began to rebuke him. But when he turned about and looked on his disciples, he rebuked Peter, saying, Get thee behind me, Satan, for thou savorest not the things that be of God, but the things that be of men. 
The point I'm trying to make here is that even a child of God can let themselves be taken over by the devil. And so it's incumbent upon us to be careful that that not happen because he's out there trying to get us. He's out there using whatever means he can find to try to trick us into coming under his rule. Look at, chap at Romans chapter 6 and let's see what the Apostle Paul has to say about this. Romans chapter 6 verses 16 through 17. You know ye not that to whom ye yield yourselves servants to obey, his servants ye are to whom ye obey, whether of sin unto death or of obedience unto righteousness. But God be thanked that ye were the servants of sin, but ye have obeyed from the heart that form of doctrine which was delivered you, which was delivered you. You see, these, these Romans could have just as easily gone the other direction and become servants of Satan, even though, they were, even though they were children of God. They could have very easily just gone ahead and gone the route of Satan. And that's what we need to make sure that people stay away from. And that's why we need to know what it is that Satan does and how it is that he approaches people so that we don't fall into that trap. Now, I mentioned this earlier. Let's spend a little bit more time on it. When in Luke 4, in, in our passage, um, Satan says, if thou be the Son of God, questioning whether or not Jesus was in fact the Son of God. In Luke chapter 3, just before that, I pointed this out last week, Luke chapter 3 and verse 22, it says at his baptism, and the Holy Ghost descended in a bodily shape like a dove upon him, and a voice came from heaven which said, Thou art my beloved Son, in thee I am well pleased. How much more evidence do you need that he's, that he's the Son of God? When you have the Father and the Son and the Holy Ghost present, when you have the entire Trinity present, declaring him to be the Son of God. How much more evidence than, do you need than that? And what does Satan do? He says, if, if you really are the Son of God, if you, if you are, this is, one of, this is one of his common attacks on, on folks. He does this all the time. He demands further proof on his terms. He wants to prove your, make you prove that you're a child of God to him on his terms. You don't need to listen to that. You don't have to give him any proof. You don't, have to, you don't owe him anything. You owe him absolutely nothing at all. You don't have to answer his questions. You don't have to answer his charges. Who's he to you? So when he comes at you, understand that. You have no obligation to even acknowledge this guy's presence. So don't. Just ignore him and get on with your life. Tell him to get behind me in Jesus' name and keep walking. Don't even get involved in the conversation. What good could come from it? Okay? In Matthew chapter 27 and verse 4, I'm sorry, verse 40. Matthew 27 and verse 40. Now these are the people around the cross at the time that was, Christ was being crucified. In other words, the devil's agents. And, and it says here in saying, Thou that destroyest the temple and buildest it in three days, save thyself if thou be the Son of God. You see, they do the same thing. So expect that. Expect that's going to be one of the attacks that comes on you. The question as to whether or not, am I really a child of God? Any of you ever had that question come into your mind? Of course you have. I'm not going to ask for people to raise their hands because I know they'd all go up in the air. 
Every one of us has struggled with that. Well, where is it coming from? Is it coming from the Word of God? Is it coming from the, your studies of the Bible? Is it coming from what God told you in His Word? No, it's not. There's no verse in here that questions you relative to that. This Bible teaches that if you believe in Christ, you are a child of God. It's just that plain. So you don't need to answer that question anymore. If you're a believer in Christ, you're a child of God. Hence, therefore, you do what God tells you to do. It's that simple. You don't need to get involved in some long, drawn-out argument as to whether or not you are. But that's the argument that will come. One, another thing that, um, that we find over in Genesis chapter 1, and this is very important, and that is one of the things that, that the devil will spend most of his time trying to get at, and that is denying the word of God. Genesis chapter 3 and verse 1. Now the serpent was more subtle than any beast of the field which the Lord God had made. And he said unto the woman, Yea, hath God said, Ye shall not eat of every tree of the garden? You see, that's one of the attacks that he'll come at you with. The idea to, to ignore what God said. To not pay any attention to God's word. And we'll, we'll get back to that in just a second. Now, I want you to see how it was that Christ um, dealt with with this temptation. First, go back to Luke chapter 4, which is our text. Where he says that man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word of God. I then want you to look at Deuteronomy chapter 8 and verse 3. And you will see that this is not a direct quote. This is where he's quoting from, but it is not a word-for-word -word direct quote. In Deuteronomy 8.3, it says, And he humbled thee, and suffered thee to hunger, and fed thee with manna, which thou knewest not, neither did thy fathers know, that he might make thee know that man doth not live by bread only, but by every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of the Lord doth man live. Now that's the verse he's quoting from. It's not an absolute direct quote, though. And this is an important point for a little bit later. Because we've made this point before. We'll, I'll make it again later in this study. And that is that one of the things that the higher critics try to jump on is this idea of variant readings. That there are differences in the text, so therefore they can't be the same. A lot of the variant readings that are in the texts were put there by God himself. And I'll show you that later on in the study. Now, one thing we need to understand, turn to Job chapter 23. One of the things that Christ was saying in this was that he was going to esteem the word of God higher than, higher than anything else. That it meant more to him than his own necessary food. Yes, he was hungry, but the word of God was more important to Christ than his own food, than his own nourishment that he needed to live on. In Job chapter 23 and verse 12, it says, Neither have I gone back from the commandment of his lips. I have esteemed the words of his mouth more necessary, more than my necessary food. And also, in John chapter 4, and this is the way that we should approach the Bible as well. We should look at the Word of God as being more important than our necessary food. We can get by for a couple of days without food, but how are we going to get by without God? How are we going to get by without him speaking to us? Do we, do we really esteem it that high? Do we really look at it that high? If we did, we probably wouldn't have a lot of the problems that we have. If we spent more time studying God's word than worrying about our updating our Facebook status, we probably wouldn't have the problems, some of the problems that we have. 
But that's human nature. We tend to put this off until there's a problem. Oh, where'd I stick my Bible? Now I need to know, because I'm in trouble, so you go hunting it down, right? I mean, that's what most folks do, unfortunately, but that's not the way Christ approached it. In John chapter 4, verses 31 through 34, it says, In the meanwhile his disciples prayed him, saying, Master, eat. But he said unto them, I have meat to eat that ye know not of. Therefore said the disciples one to another, Hath any man brought him aught to eat? Jesus saith unto them, My meat is to do the will of him that sent me and to finish his work. That's what was most important to Christ. That's what should be most important to you. Don't worry about the food. That'll, you'll be taken care of on that. But what should be most important is to do the will of God. And that will help you through the temptations at the times when Satan decides to come after you. You see, turn to Exodus chapter 16. Christ knew that God could feed him. He knew that in time, at the right time, that God would feed him. God had done it before. When there was no possible way of being fed, God had fed a nation. In Exodus chapter 16, it says, And they took their journey from Elam, and all the congregation of the children of Israel came into the wilderness of Sin, which is between Elam and Sinai, on the fifteenth day of the second month, after their departing out of the land of Egypt. And the whole congregation of the children of Israel murmured against Moses and Aaron in the wilderness. And the children of Israel said unto them, Would to God we had died by the hand of the Lord in the land of Egypt when we sat by the flesh pots and were and when we did have eat uh, when we did eat bread to the full for he had brought us into this wilderness to kill the whole assembly with hunger then said the Lord unto Moses behold I will rain bread from heaven for you and the people shall go out and gather a certain rate every day that I may prove them whether they will walk in my law or no you see, God was able to feed these people out in the wilderness. Every morning there was manna. They found this thing, kind of bread-looking thing that tasted like honey on the ground. And they would gather enough for that day. And on the, on the Sabbath, they would gather twice, or the day before the Sabbath, they'd grab, gather twice as much to feed them through those two days. And, but it was only good for a day. If they tried to gather too much, then the next day it'd be full of worms and they couldn't eat it. God was able to feed them. For 40 years he fed them. They never had to lift a finger other than to go out and pick it up off the ground. After a while they started complaining about that because they got tired of eating the same stuff all the time. But the point being, Christ knew full well that he could that God could feed him at a moment's notice. Whenever God felt like doing it, God could do it. Look at chapter 17. And all the congregation of the children of Israel journeyed from the wilderness of sin after their journeys according to the commandment of the Lord, and pitched in Rephardim, and there was no water for the people to drink. Wherefore the people did chide with Moses, and said, Give us water that we may drink. And Moses said unto them, Why chide ye with me? Wherefore do ye tempt the Lord? And the people thirsted there for water, and the people murmured against Moses, and said, Wherefore is this that thou hast brought us up out of Egypt to kill us and our children and our cattle with thirst? And Moses cried unto the Lord, saying, What shall I do unto this people? They be, all, they, they be almost ready to stone me. And the Lord said unto Moses, Go on before the people and take with thee of the elders of Israel and thy rod wherewith thou smotest the river. Take in thine hand and go. Behold, I will stand before thee there upon the rock in Horeb, and thou shalt smite the rock and there shall come water out of it that the people may drink. And Moses did so in the sight of the elders of Israel, and they got water. God can feed people in a wilderness. He could water them in a wilderness. He could certainly take care of his own son in the wilderness. Christ knew that. So when Satan came after him with this temptation to turn stones into bread, what would be the point of that? God will feed him whenever he feels like feeding him. When the time is right, God will take care of him. But he was 
But see, what Satan was tempting Christ to do is the same thing he tempts us to do. He was tempting Christ to run ahead of God, to not wait on him, to run out and do it yourself and kick the door open yourself. That's what he was tempting him to do, and Christ wouldn't do it. But that's the same thing that the devil does to us constantly. Every chance he gets, he tries to get us to step out there and control things when God should be in control of them. To try to take the reins away from God and try to control our own destinies when God is completely in control. When if we just sit back and let God do it, it'll work out. But we tend to think that we need to get in the middle of it. And that's what Satan does. He tempts people to do this. Turn to Mark chapter 10 and verse 45. It says, For even the Son of Man came not to be ministered unto, but to minister, and to give his life a ransom for many. Now, I'm going to announce right now, Wendy doesn't have her rabbit, but I'm going to announce I'm going to chase one for a minute. So it's probably a good thing she left it at home. Look at that verse. Gave himself a ransom for many. Would that not be the perfect place to put the entire human race if if God meant the entire human race? Wouldn't that be a good place to stick that? But that's not what he put in there. He put in the word many. A ransom, a ransom is um, the money or price paid for the redemption of a prisoner or slave, or for goods captured by an enemy. That which procures the release of a prisoner or captive or of captured property and restores the one to liberty and the other to the original owner. That's what the word rapture mean, or uh, ransom means. A release from captivity, bondage, or the possession of an enemy. In law, a sum paid for the pardon of some great offense and the discharge of the offender or a fine paid in lieu of corporal punishment. That's what a ransom is. He gave his life a ransom. His life was the price paid for the redemption of somebody that was a prisoner or a slave or for goods that were captured by an enemy. You starting to see particular redemption in this? He paid a price for certain for a certain people. This word many means numerous, comprising a great number of individuals. As in, thou shalt be a father of many nations, when God talked to Abraham in Genesis 17. Many nations, not all, but many. Paul said in 1 Corinthians chapter 1 that not many wise men after the flesh, not many mighty, not many noble are called. You see, many does not mean all. Many means many, but not all. And Christ gave himself a ransom for many. He did not give himself a ransom for all. Because had he given himself, a, his life, a ransom for all, then every human being, without exception, would be eternally saved. You do not pay a price for something and then not collect the something that you ransomed in return for the price not what the words mean. Just look up the definition of the words. If you pay a ransom for something, you get in return the thing that you paid the ransom for. So if Christ came down and died for everybody, then the word ransom here would have to refer to everybody. And he would have paid the price for everyone and hell would be an empty place and everyone would go to heaven. Now we know that's not the case because we read of people 
in the Bible that end up in hell. So clearly he didn't die for everybody. And if there's one person that he didn't die for, then it's limited, it's unlimited atonement. That's the rabbit for this morning. Okay. So the point being here though that Christ came down here not to not to be ministered to, but to minister. And unlike the first Adam, when Adam took of the food that he probably didn't need, Christ refused the food that he actually did need, knowing that God could provide it at the time that God was ready to. Now, I want you to consider how well this temptation applies in your life, in the life of a Christian. Number one, Satan will do whatever he can do to try to knock you off the Word of God. Any way that he can get you away from your Bible, he will use it. Any avenue that he can use to keep you from studying your Bible, he will use it. Anything that he can throw up in front of you to make it make you more... I mean, we, we look, at, look at the technology today. Has, let me ask you a question. With all of the cell phones and the computer programs and all of the rest of this instant technology that we have, are you reading your Bible more today than you were before this stuff? Do people pay more attention to their Bibles today than they did in the 1800s before phones came around and they used to read them every night before you went to bed? Because that was the only book you had in the house. Are we a more godly nation today than we were 150 years ago? Are people out there more godly today than they were in my generation when I was a little kid? Are we getting closer and closer to God or are we getting farther and farther away? You don't have to answer. I think, I think we all agree on the answer. This stuff hasn't helped us a bit. Not when it comes to the things of God. We're not spending any more time reading the Bible than we ever did. Even though we've got access to it now on 17 different platforms, it doesn't mean that we're going to open it and read it. It doesn't do you any good to have the fastest computer program if you don't open the program. It doesn't help you to have the Bible if you don't open it and read it. And Satan will do what he can to keep you away from this Bible. Give, now, give, me, give me an example of this. The school of higher criticism. You've, you've heard me talk about this. They talk about this in colleges. They talk about it in seminaries. The idea that we do not have a preserved word of God. The idea that, that we have something close but not exact. If you look at Luke chapter three and verse or chapter two and verse thirty three, Luke chapter two and verse thirty three, it says this And Joseph and his mother marveled at those things which were spoken of him, referring to Christ. Joseph and his mother, his mother being Mary, marveled at those things which were spoken of him. Okay? That's what the King James Bible says. You know what the New International Version says in that same passage? It says the child's father and mother marveled at what was said about him. Yeah. Now wait a minute. The child's father was God. Why would God marvel about what was said about him and why would that be recorded in the Bible? Or is the NIV trying to give the impression that Joseph was the child's father? The English Standard Version says much the same as the NIV, and his father and his mother marveled at what was said about him. You see, there's just, that's just one verse out of thousands of verses that have been changed in the new Bibles for the express reason to try to knock you off what the Bible actually says. The King James clearly says that it was Joseph. Joseph wasn't Christ's father. 
He was thought to be his father, but he wasn't. If he was his father, then Christ isn't God, and you're still in your sins. So you see, this is one, another one of those attacks that comes at us from the idea that you can understand this one easier than you can the others. And people run around with these things and start to learn false doctrine out of them with men in pulpits standing up and declaring them to be the Word of God. That's one way that Satan's used to try to knock us off of the Bible. Give us a Bible that isn't a Bible and convince us it's just as good. How about universities? Secular universities that teach atheism and evolution and uniformitarianism and humanism. The class that, that Wendy and my son Josh just got through taking on the Old Testament where the guy didn't even believe that the Old Testament was written by the people that wrote it. And understand that the devil will always appeal to your greatest weakness. And if he thinks he can somehow wiggle his way in here and convince you, well, maybe that is right. Maybe those new Bibles are better than this one. Maybe that's what I should be paying attention to. He will use it. And he will try to tempt you to prove that you're a child of God on his terms just like he did with Christ. He'll also try to tempt you to run ahead of God and do things that you think God, well, this would be good, but if you're running ahead of God, it's probably not good. Look at, look at the examples that we have of people that ran ahead of Look at Abraham, he ran ahead of God. That kind of created a problem for thousands of years that people are still dealing with today. But that's one of the things he'll try to do, try to get you to run ahead of him. Try to get you to give up on the word. Try to tempt you into, into finding something to replace this with. Another thing that he uses, and he uses this one very well, and that is material possessions. Matthew chapter 6 and verse 33 says to seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and all these things will be added unto you. All the temporal things will be added to you if you seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. So Satan will tempt a child of God during times of trouble to mistrust what God said about that. He might throw something at you like, well, if you're such a good Christian, then why are you having so many troubles? Why are you having so many problems? Why, why, why are you going through so much, so much trouble? He'll, t he'll try to tempt you to comply with the idea that, he's, that maybe he's right, that maybe I shouldn't be going through this much trouble, that maybe I've, somehow I've made a mistake, maybe I'm following the wrong thing. I wouldn't be going through as much trouble as I'm going through. That's one of the temptations that he'll launch at you. Remember, we, we read in Romans 6 that, Know ye not that to whom ye yield yourselves servants to obey, obey, his servant you are. If you decide to obey the devil, then you're his servants until you can figure out a way to get out from underneath that. And so it's important that you understand who it is that's talking to you when they start talking to you. And remember, I've said this before, if you want God to speak to you, read your Bible. This is how he speaks to you. And if you want to hear God speak to you audibly, then read it out loud. <laughs> because this is how God speaks to you. This, he's given us everything we need right here between these pages. Don't listen to voices in your head and think that's God speaking to me unless it lines up with something that you read here. Because Satan will you do whatever he, whatever he can do to try to tempt you and knock you off of this. You know, one of the 
Well, let's jump down to this next, the next one, verses 5 through 8. I think I can get through this. Luke chapter 4, verses 5 through 8. And the devil taketh him up unto an high mountain, and showed him all the kingdoms of the world in a moment of time. And the devil said unto him, All this power will I give thee, and the glory of them, for that is delivered unto me, and to whomsoever I will I give it. You see anywhere in here where Christ refuted him? That's an interesting point, isn't it? See, the kingdoms of this world, while God is in control, and God suffers certain things to happen, don't think that those men are men of God that are running the kingdoms of this world. The devil says right here, Whomsoever I will, I give it. And Christ did not refute him. If thou therefore wilt worship me, all shall be thine. I got a feeling that there's some people that have bowed the knee to the guy by the name of Satan. And as a result are standing in power over us right now. And will continue to do so and have done so for thousands of years. That's how it works. Now God will only allow things to go so far. There's a point at which he, that's, you've gone too far. Now we're going to bend you like a river. And I've shown you the verses that teach that in the past. But, but those men that are standing, don't put your, don't put your hopes in a guy. Don't think that this politician is going to be the one that saves the day. Because that politician's working for the same guy that the other politician's working for. They get their marching orders from the same dude. It may not look quite as bad, but they're, they're running a game on you. It's a shell game. Remember the thing where they put the P underneath the... And they play a shell game on you. And they make it look like you're actually in control. This, this nation has not been in control since 1865. We lost the Constitutional Republic in 1865 at Appomattox Courthouse. It's been a totalitarian dictatorship ever since. The whole thing changed in 1865. So, and don't expect it to go back. And don't expect that those guys are going to be the ones that are going to make things happy for you. Because we see right here who it is that's putting them in control. And he offered it to Christ. He offered this very same thing to Christ. Who, if thou therefore wilt worship me, all shall be thine. And Jesus answered and said unto him, Get thee behind me, Satan, for it is written, Thou shalt worship the Lord thy God, and him only shalt thou serve. Now, Something I want you to pay close attention to. Every time that he's done something like this, what's he's quoting scripture at him, isn't he? Christ keeps quoting scripture at the devil. We were told over in James that if you resist the devil, he will flee from you. How do you suppose it is that you resist the devil? You resist him with scripture. Why do you think it might be that he doesn't want you to have scripture? Why do you think it is that he, that he keeps your life so busy that you don't have any time to sit down and read your Bible? That, you don't have, that, that he tries to knock you off of what the Bible is anyway so that you don't even know what it is? Why do you suppose it is that he does that? Because your only defense against him is scripture. And if you don't have it, then you're defenseless. If you don't know the Bible, how are you going to argue against him? You can't. The only arguments you've got are Bible verses. And if you're limited to three Bible verses and that's all you've got in your memory bank, all he's got to do is come at you at one of those, where one of those isn't going to fit. And he's got you. And meanwhile, while you're trying to find the verse to, argue, to, to hit him with, He's already moved three steps ahead of you. That's why you need to study your Bible. That's, you know, we talk about the Bereans being more noble because they, they would check out what 
the apostles would say. They'd go out and search the scriptures daily to make sure that what they were being told was the truth. Daily, folks. They searched them daily. They spent time learning the Word of God. And if you spend time in the Word of God, studying the Word of God, learning the Word of God, memorizing the Word of God, making the Word of God something that you can call up as fast as a computer program can, then you're going to be pretty, you're going to be a hard nut for Satan to crack. And chances are he'll go, he'll go find a, an easier, he'll go find an easier target. And that's where you should be. That's how, that's how you should be spending time. Because that's what's used to defeat him. Look at John chapter 12 and verse 31. Talking about the, the case where, where the devil has a control over, over these different powers, it says in verse 31, Now is the judgment of this world, now shall the prince of this world be cast out. You see, Christ did not refute that position. He did not say, no, Satan, you don't have any control over these powers. In fact, he said exactly the opposite. Look at Ephesians chapter 6 and verse 12. For we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. That's who we're actually fighting against. And Satan says here that he gives the kingdoms of this world to whomever he will. Flip back to Daniel chapter 4. right after Ezekiel in the in the major prophet last of the major prophets Daniel chapter 4 verse 17 it says this matter is by degree, decree of the watchers and and the demand by the word of the holy ones to the intent that the living may know that the most high ruleth in the kingdoms of men and giveth it to whomsoever he will and setteth up over it the basest of men now we've got, a, we've, we've got verses here that talk about Satan putting people in control and then we have this verse that indicates that God's putting them in control. Actually, God is suffering certain things to, to have happen. But notice, who, notice who's in control here, the basest of men. Now, in this temptation, when Satan is tempting Christ to have all of the king, to get, that he would give him the kingdoms, is it not a fact that Christ is going to get all the kingdoms anyway? Is that not a, is that not the case? First Corinthians chapter fifteen, verse twenty-five. says for he must reign till he hath put all enemies under his feet the last enemy that shall be destroyed is death for he hath put all things under his feet but when he saith all things are put under him it is manifest that he is accepted which he put all things under him in other words see all of the kingdoms of this world will be ruled by Christ anyway how can Satan offer him something that he already possesses? Satan may think that he's got it, but and for all intents and purposes is ruling it. But he can only go as far as God will allow him to go. And he will only go as far as Christ will allow him to go. Look at Revelation chapter 11 and verse 15. And the seventh angel sounded, and there were great voices in heaven, saying, The kingdoms of this world 
are become the kingdoms of our Lord and of his Christ, and he shall reign forever and ever. The point, however, is that again, Satan was tempting Christ to run ahead of God. Why wait? Why wait? Have them now. Worship me and you can have them now. I'm going to make one more point here and then we'll close up for this morning. Turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 10. First Corinthians chapter 10 verses 20 through 21. Paul says, "But I say that the things which the Gentiles sacrifice, they sacrifice to devils and not to God, and I would not that ye should have fellowship with devils. Ye cannot drink the cup of the Lord and the cup of devils, ye cannot be partakers of the Lord's table and the table of devils." One of the things we need to understand in this, and, and, and considering that we're coming up on another election year, let's not lose sight of this. One of the reasons that these politicians are the basest of men, most of them are involved in occult religion. Most of them are involved in some sort of Satan worship. Most of them are tied directly to that side of things. We shouldn't be looking to them as the person that's going to help us in any way, shape, or form. They're not. This is why they're the basest of men, because they serve the devil in order to reach their political positions. It also explains why so many of them are members of the lodge. Why so many of them are involved in this kind of stuff. And this device the device that, that the devil is actually using on Christ at this point is to try to give him material gain. If you, if you possess all of the kingdoms, then you possess all of the goods. If, you, if, if someone gives you all of this power, they also give you all of the goods that come with that power. You also get all of the material gain that comes with that power. And that's really where the temptation is at. And that's a temptation that's used by Satan and has been used forever. It's the very thing he used in the Garden of Eden when he, when he came to Eve in the Garden. The idea that he can give you all of the material gain that you could ever possibly want. He can grant you all of the power that you could ever possibly want. That's the temptation that he's giving to Christ. And that's a temptation that comes to us as well. On a daily basis in some cases. Now, luckily, I mean, for me anyway, I don't have to deal with it that much anymore because I live in a little room by myself. But the rest of you that are out there in the world, you, you deal with this stuff all the time. It's constant. You're, you're barraged with it. You can't turn a television set on without seeing this kind of stuff. It's everywhere you look. It's always been his temptation. It's always been one of the things that, that he tries to lead people into. I mean, look at the... Um, look at the state of where people stand today and I you know what I'm not I'm not any better than anybody else either um, but look at how far in debt people have gotten it didn't used to be this way it used to be that people stayed out of debt and it was it was my father's greatest desire to pay his house off and to not have any debt. He was one of the lucky ones that was actually able to do it. To pay everything off. That, that's the way it used to. It's not that way now. Not at all. And it's certainly not what we're what the advertisers are trying to get us to do. They want us to be up here somewhere. Again, running ahead. 
with that, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to wrap up for this morning um, because I've got a just, if I stop here, I've got enough to finish one more. But if I keep going, then I'm going to go late today and not get it done anyway. So let's stop right here. Um, we'll pick back up next week and, uh, and continue on with, the, the, with the, the temptation of Christ. But, and so I thank you. Let's stand and sing the first three verses of number 154. And we'll be dismissed in prayer.